So I just want to go ahead and introduce her. Um, so Trevor's she found Films in 2014 as a way to bridge the art and sciences, uh, focusing on wildlife and conservation stories. Uh, she just won an Emmy for the story of plastic, which she contributed cinematography. And her partner, uh, Trevor Frost, is a photographer and filmmaker whose work fo focuses on the human relationship with wildlife and wild places. Uh, Trevor has always had an adventurous spirit. I'm so happy to see him here today. Both of them extremely talented, and I'll let them take it away. Thank you, Ivy. It's great to be here on Earth Day. Happy Earth Day, everybody. Um, mm -hmm. It's really a special group of people coming together. So we're, yeah, we're excited to be here. Uh, hi, Tiff. Nice to see you. Hi, great to um, see you both. I can't believe it. <laughs> I know. It feels like a lifetime. Uh, it's been quite a whirlwind for us. So just to give you a little bit of background on our work and kind of how we got to this point. So like, uh, like Ivy mentioned, um, I have a production company, Emerging Earth Films, which started about a decade ago. Uh, so I actually went to school for painting and printmaking. Fine art was my background. I grew up with a paintbrush in my hand and always running around in the woods and picking mushrooms and turning over logs, looking at bugs and things. Um, and I was always kind of interested in combining the arts and sciences. It was something that my mom's a musician, my dad's an artist, and science was always a big part of who I was and what I was interested in. And so eventually film, I realized, became kind of the perfect medium for me to combine the two. Um, and it was a way for me to explore, you know, places and ideas and connect with scientists in, in ways that, you know, I didn't feel like painting was allowing me to. Um, and so really it started as a journey of kind of self-discovery and teaching teaching myself how to pick up a camera, how to, um, you know, edit. I learned editing on YouTube in a, in a small hut up in, up in Maine. Um, so, you know, it kind of unconventional route to, to film. Um, but it was, it was not long, you know, it was about what, seven, eight years ago now that Trevor and I connected and started working together and realized that our skills we're actually amazingly compatible in terms of our, our interest in environmental storytelling and then also the work that he was doing at that time, uh, which I'll let him tell you about. I mean, as you know, one of the things, if you look at storytelling that's that's happening around conservation or environmental issues, mu much of it is failing. Um, there's really not a lot of examples out there of, of a film or, or photo that has actually shifted things in a very, very long time. So like in 2001, this, this scientist and, and explorer named Mike Fay did this project called the Mega Transect in, in Gabon and, and Congo. And that, that trek that he did and the, the information that they got from that trek and the, the resulting articles in National Geographic and the films that were made helped convince the president of the country to create 11 national parks pretty much overnight. And then after that, it was like this race to figure out how to actually implement the parks, protect the parks, have rangers. And so that's something that they're still working on to this day. But in terms of a story, actually convincing people to make changes to save, you know, wild places and, and the wildlife in it, um, that's that's a great example. And then, of course, there's like Blackfish, which was a, a film that brought a billion dollar corporation to its knees. Um, so as somebody who is who is very interested in how can stories actually move the dial? How can they actually create change? You know, I started looking at my own photography and realizing that for the most part it was failing. And there are many reasons for that. Certainly one of them is that magazines are dying and newspapers are dying. And so it's very difficult for a single image or a collection of images to kind of make the same change, I think. It's not impossible. There's still images every now and then that come out that go viral that do have a major impact. Like, you know, I think of the the Syrian boy that was found dead on the on the beach uh, beaches of Greece, you know, that brought a lot of attention, and a lot of resources to some of the, the the refugee crisis that was happening because of the conflict in Syria. So photos still have a place. I'm not saying that, 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 that they don't. But as I began to look around at the impact of my work and the work of, of other photographers, I started to become disillusioned with with photography. And that was what sort of helped me move into film. And then also Melissa was super interested in film and that was her main focus. And so she had a lot, a big role to play in convincing me to move in into film as well. 
but then if we were going to make a film, how were we going to make a film that was going to be able to reach new audiences? Like I, I actually, if I make a film, I want to be able to reach Fox News viewers. And, um, and that led us to, you know, the, the perfect project that sort of jump started our filmmaking careers, really, which was Wildcat. It's a film that's out on Amazon Prime now. It's been out for, I think, four or five months since end of December. And uh, and it it's a we'll play a trailer, which will kind of do a better job than, than me summarizing it. But, you know, the main element of it is it follows a, a young man, a young woman as they rehabilitate wildlife in, in the Peruvian Amazon. And of particular interest is that the, the young man, he's a veteran, right? And so instantly, because he's a veteran, we can appeal to conservatives and people who traditionally won't pay attention to a film like this. And so I guess what, what we're really trying to do is find stories that will allow us access to a community who traditionally does not pay any attention. In fact, they, you know, they actually really hate these kinds of films normally. Um, and so that's kind of, I think, one of the main ways that we're moving. Um, and I would probably. I think, yeah, before we cue the trailer, I'll just say, too, I think it's important to mention that, that the work that we do and how we've. How we've kind of, um, you know, carved out the work, the work that we're focusing on is really character driven. Um, and I think that that's a really important part of our work is that you know, if you can take people on a journey, if you can pull their heartstrings, if you can tap into that deeper sense of humanity and why we're doing this work, we're all trying to figure this out in real time. You know, the planet is dying around us and there's some incredible people that are doing incredible work. And how can we, like Trevor mentioned, how can we tap into new audiences and the way that we feel like we can be most effective in this space is by bringing people on an emotional journey through largely a human narrative that connects them with nature, connects them with the natural world, conservation. We kind of like to call our work like backdoor conservation films because you come in thinking that you're you know, experiencing a kind of a human drama and you leave with an appreciation or an understanding of a place or an animal or a connection to nature you know, that you might not have felt before. And I think Bell is really the important word here as opposed to understand because there's so much data there's so, you know and science undoubtedly is absolutely critical right now we need more and more of it but in terms of communication in terms of pulling in uh, and moving the moving the, the dial you know how do we really inspire people to to want to get on board and to care um, and so that's that's kind of at the core of the work that we do um, so Nina, if you want to cue the trailer, we'll give you a little teaser here of Wildcat. I love you. I'm in this most beautiful place in the world and I can't be happy. When I was in Afghanistan, I was medically discharged with PTSD. I felt that life wasn't worth living. And maybe I should just go when no one knows if I'm alive, no one knows if I'm dead. And then I met Sam. That's when my life really took a turn. This is Keanu, our ocelot rescue. He will be reintroduced into the wild in a year and a half. I didn't know if it was going to be doable. Their alternative is living a life in the zoo or dying in a much worse way. This is your new home. Don't give up. Don't give up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to teach you how to become a killer. Amazon tree boa. This is the snake. This project with Keanu, it's like his redemption. He's saving me and I'm saving him. This is one of the most dangerous environments in the world. That's a wandering spider. Keanu, I know it still hurts. It's really difficult working in an unprotected area. <sighs> you okay? You scared me. <laughs> Don't follow me. Now he knows where Harry lives. So I'm worried that he can't live by himself. 
caught his first rodent. He caught his first rodent. I love you, I've got. I've seen the jungle change people. I feel like I've done something good. It's hard to let go of something you love. But it's now or never. We're wild animals, me and you. We're wild. It's also uh, worth mentioning that OCE was an incredibly important part of launching this film and helping us actually get down to the Amazon in those early trips um, and some of our early support. So... Thank you, Tiffany, Ivy, and, and OCE. Um, well, we couldn't be more proud and can't celebrate your success enough. And it's so nice to see people who are in the trenches being recognized. You know how rare that is. And you know how happy we are when we see talent and commitment and integrity rise to the top. And that's you know one of the beautiful things about the World Hope Forum today is that we do get to... to showcase some of these people that you would never hear of because we don't do sexy famous work we do kind of tedious complicated technical stuff so yes i mean we've we couldn't be more happy with your success and we hope that you're able to bring you know the next generation up along with you and give them what they need to replicate what you're doing if that's possible I think that uh, one of the things that I would just add is that in that in Wildcat, one of the things that attracted me to the story when I when I met the two characters, I was down in the Amazon on a totally different project. And one of the things that attracted me to them was that they were two people who just saw something that was wrong in the world and tried to make it right. And I understand that in certain fields, you know, like I don't want a surgeon operating on me that hasn't, you know, gone through at least some training, right? Like I'm at, if I, if I need a surgery, I'm going to go to a teaching hospital. So there's probably going to be students that are actually part of the operation. But so I, I'm totally a believer in, 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 ed, in education and certifications. But at a certain point, you know, especially in the conservation sort of world, the world is, is on fire, literally. And we need more people who are just going to start acting and stop making sure that they have everything they need to do it. And what I saw in Harry and Sam when we decided to take this film on was two young people who just saw this cat that needed help. There was no one else that was going to take it. It was going to end up in a zoo if they didn't do it. And they put everything they had into it. And did they make mistakes? hundred percent. They made a lot of mistakes, but if you go down to her organization now, six years later, the organization is a completely different place. I mean, it is top notch. It's one of the best rescue centers in the world. They have, I think 25 different cats now. So, you know, we're, we're particularly attracted, obviously, as Melissa said, to films that um, are, allow us to reach new audiences and films that are about a sort of a human character that attach, you know, allows you to kind of think about the environment differently. And then I think also people who, you know, are just out there and doing it. And so our next film that we're working on right now, and we can share a few images if you would like. Um, yeah, we'd love that. Yes, it's a, it's a it's a film in similar India, story. similar in certain ways, but different in others. And it follows this young man here in this this image. Um, so I was in India again on a on a totally unrelated project, uh, trying to photograph snake rescuers, and I stumbled upon this young man who is a snake rescuer, was just becoming a snake rescuer at the time. And so I followed him around for about a week and we basically went around on, on scooters all throughout the streets of Mysore, which is a, a city in the southern part of India. And pretty much all day long, he would rescue snakes. I mean, on some days he was rescuing 25, 30 snakes out of people's homes. What was so funny is he was not only rescuing the snakes, but he was also rescuing the people in, in a lot of cases because about 70% of the snakes that he rescues are, are venomous. So in this picture you see it's a, it's a cobra, a spectacled cobra. Um, and it was actually in their toilet, which is around the left in the corner here. Oh. Uh, so you can imagine that the, this poor woman went in there to go to the bathroom and there was a cobra literally curled up in her toilet. And uh, and so obviously this was all very exciting and it was kind of high, high, you know, fast paced and high energy. But what really pulled me in was I saw the relationship that he had with his father, who was also a snake rescuer. And at the time, his father was extremely, still is, was extremely famous, not just in Mysore, but actually across all of India. And I thought to myself, 
where on where else in the world could someone become famous for rescuing snakes like when i say famous like he walks down the street and people take selfies with him so immediately i thought there's got to be something to that so i kept in touch with with both his father and surya who's in this photo and then a year ago went back to india to start putting together materials to start this film and then melissa actually just returned from from her not her first trip to india but her first trip uh filming with surya and um and yeah so we're super excited to work on this and and show and uh, you know again this is another example of somebody who saw this need right these snakes are appearing in people's homes because people are expanding into into you know existing wild areas natural areas and the snakes will just be killed in many cases so he is going out and rescuing them and also doing a service for the people and so there's a lot of different threads that we're going to be able to tap into a father-son relationship the 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 sacrifices that you make when you have when you when you give yourself to something that's larger than yourself like whether you're a scientist or you're working in conservation it comes with so many sacrifices time away from family and loved ones and um so we want to try to tap into that and uh, uh we you know we're still trying to figure out the story we're going to be filming for the next probably two years and and then another year or so of editing so you know 2026 <laughs> mark mark your calendars yeah i think it's already I, done what's that it's already done i already wrote it down <laughs> i mean of course every film is a journey if you know if you had told us when we started wildcat uh we'd have the film we have now and and the response we wouldn't believe you um so you know we're we're buckled in and ready to, ready to take the ride for this next one but um yeah, I think there's, I think there's, again, there's this really interesting human, you know, drama, human story, human arc that um, is at the core of this film. And there's, snakes are one of those things too, where they're revered and hated. And globally, you know, there's a lot of people that, of course, you know, pray to snakes and they're in, in India in particular, they're seen as gods, cobras um, specifically. And yet there's this duality. And I think that when you watch people and you, you know, we watched, I filmed at least a hundred rescues on my last shoot, but in some ways, what's more interesting is how people respond to the snakes. And, 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 you know, you're also going into people's houses. And so there's this, this intimacy and in how, you know, how we're also looking at coexistence. And I think that that's something we're also interesting, interested in exploring, you know, as humanity continues to and has already taken over, you know, the majority of the globe, how do we define coexistence and what is kind of the the goal of success with wildlife? You know, will we get to a point where we accept wild animals in our yards and our houses? You know, to what degree? Um, and I think that that's something that Surya, our main character, is you know interested in exploring and hopes to achieve with his work is you know, eventually getting to a point where maybe, you know, let's say all people are okay with at least a non-venomous snake being in their yard or around their house. Um, and, and how can we better educate and spread, spread information that gives people the tools to understand what is, what isn't venomous. Um, and ultimately, how, you know, how do we learn to coexist? Because I think the question continues to come up. It's like, who's in whose home? you know, and we, he might be rescuing the snakes from people's houses, but ultimately humanity is in, you know, these wild animals homes. And I, um, and so I think, it's, yeah. And I, I think I just say that like, and for, for me, the thing that this story does is the reason that it gives me hope is that you not only see people who are becoming famous for doing something that is kind of so unusual, right? Like if you told somebody here, like imagine someone becoming famous in America for, rescuing snakes like it just doesn't happen like wildlife rehabbers here like don't get recognized at all so that that struck me as something that's hopeful and then the other thing of course is that like in a single day you might rescue 30 snakes and so the fact that people are actually calling and having animals rescued versus just killing them is another very very hopeful thing for me and so that's that's something that you know was really important in in this film because the doom and gloom um is 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 clearly not working in, unless it's perfectly packaged. This is his father. His name, he goes by Snake Sham. Everyone knows him in the whole city and beyond. And he's somewhat of a legend. He looks like, you know, someone out of a Harley Davidson motorcycle gang. <laughs> Got Cobra rings. And um, what's really amazing too, and this is something that I'm very interested in exploring in this film is 
their ability to communicate with these animals um, because when you see them doing these snake rescues and you know like Trevor mentioned the majority are venomous they do it with such ease and as if they are speaking with the snake and there's ways that Surya in particular you know calms the snake down his dad it's almost like you know watching a, a high level ballerina or someone that just has such an awareness of their body is able to communicate with the animal in ways that you know we can't put our finger on um and i think it's really there's there's something really special about their connection with these animals um and that's something that you know we're interested in, in exploring too because there is something deeper there. And I think with film, you know, it's one of the few mediums that you have the opportunity to convey things beyond information, you know, and, and beyond the mind, um, you tap into something a little bit deeper. So this is his dad. He's, uh, he's essentially, you know, passing on this tradition to his son, except his son has taught himself. This is, um, a picture that Trevor took in Mysore. You can see all of these cobra deities here that um, people are praying to. So like we mentioned, it's uh, a big part of, you know, the spirituality in Hinduism. And we'll, <clears throat> we'll leave you with this. Beautiful. That's amazing. This is, wow. this is an image that I took. This is one of the reasons that I was in India in the first place when I then stumbled upon <laughs> Terry and his father, which is to make images of snakes in, in human hands. And the idea was to take these, these animals that are perhaps the most vilified and persecuted animals on the planet um, and show them at calm and, and peaceful. And, uh, and obviously everybody that was holding them were people that had, as Melissa was talking about, a sort of communion with, with wild animals like Surya, not just with snakes, but when he, I watched him rescue like a six foot tall stork that could have sliced his arm open to the bone. And he, it was just amazing. The stork went sort of just placid and he just picks this thing up and carries it to safety and, and rehabilitated it over several months. Um, so that was the point of this image, but obviously now I'm, I've fallen in love with film. So we're, we're, <laughs> we're later focused on, on that. Well done. Well done. Uh, Melissa, your work is done. You got, you got a, a true believer of film now and you're off back to India. Thank you for your work. We're so grateful that you could hang on today and present to us. It's so fascinating. And we'll